everyone, welcome to The Smartest Moron, where we return with the old review format, a review of Shadow Hearts from the New World, and... Screw it, I'm not gonna lie to you guys. I'm not really a big fan of this game. As much as I love the series, From the New World is just... Will you see in a bit? If you couldn't tell already, this particular Shadow Hearts game is extremely different. While I am used to seeing silly things within this series, it's easy to tell from the New World is trying a tad too hard in this case. It hardly even mentions the previous games too, having a cameo here and there, but only Roger Bacon is all that important. And even then, not really all that much. And honestly, I'm perfectly fine with that so long as they build up their new content. You can guess how well that turned out when a good majority of people I know kept saying to just never touch this game. We almost never got this game either. Covenant sold poorly, so Midway didn't want to translate the title. Instead, we have the company that won't credit people who quit their job. Yeah, I'm not letting that go, Exceed. Considering the work they do with Senra and Kagura, I say that makes some sense with the zaniness. Maybe a bit too much in this case. Unfortunately, that's about all the info Google was going to throw at me, so I have no idea why they suddenly switched from some serious storytelling with jokes to just... a joke. What I can tell you is that this was actually the first Shadow Hearts game I ever got. I was bored one day, needed something new, and since no GameStop ever had the previous titles, I settled for this one. And starting with a fresh cast actually helped me a ton too, since I didn't have to worry too much about the first two games. I remember having a decent time, and that is literally all I can say because I barely remember a damn thing beyond titties and stupid. Playing this years later... Well... Some things have changed. So basically we have another Mega Man X Command Mission situation where I liked the game a lot back then, but now... Ugh, there are problems here and there. So let's not waste any time. Let's dive into Shadow Hearts from the New World. Also, by the way, can I say I hate this freaking cover? Surprisingly, this plays very much like Covenant, so I don't think there's much else I gotta elaborate on. Mainly because even with the improvements, I recommend sticking the Covenant and the original game over this. But some of the changes are actually pretty good. The magic system, for example. Rather than it just being a list and equipping stuff, now there are constellations. These things can be customized to upgrade spell levels, their MP usage, their damage, or even just change it all together. Back in Covenant, certain people were limited with this stuff, likely due to their potential as a mage, so you wouldn't get much out of them as a caster since their stat was likely weak enough to just go with physical moves like with Joachim. Here, the spell limit is really only decided by constellations and your imagination. This is what I love the most about From the New World, but then again, I love making even tiny tweaks to my gear, even if my strategy is to mostly just hit things harder. Speaking of hitting harder, the combo system is back and I really like it this time. Back in Covenant, I rarely used it since it was always a gamble and could waste a ton of turns, as you need to line your party up to initiate it. Now though, you can just start a combo whenever you want so long as you have some levels in the stock meter, which maxes out at 2. You can even use the double action, enabling two skills at once, which is necessary if you want to hit an enemy with a certain spell, like knocking them into the air or onto the floor. And yes, it can be used in the combo, racking up even more damage. All this sounds great, right? Well, the enemy can do this too, and does it often, plus if you don't finish them off in that combo, they get more turns and will beat the living shit out of you. I learned this the hard way in a boss fight against two opponents, and then against one of the side quest bosses. I wanna call that boss the comedy relief villain, but then again I remember there's a few of those in this game, and also that includes Joachim, who is sadly not playable. But on the positive side, you still got Johnny! The new additions of the combo system and rebalancing enemy stats has made From the New World slightly more challenging than Covenant. Plus, with the emphasis on magic, I felt physical fighters were not as useful. Barring, of course, the broken mind's eye, but I found my attacks missing the mark quite a bit, so I just needed one dedicated fighter while the rest of my team were on support and mage duty. I didn't even find enough overpowered keys, but trust me, I was still able to cheese my way through some of these guys. The dungeons this time, though, uh, these feel way shorter and easier than in Covenant. In the previous games, it was very easy to get lost. Not helped when it lacked the minimap, or maybe I just didn't know what the button was, so I needed a guide in a few places. Thankfully, this game provides us with one at last, 
but now it's no longer needed, not when these dungeons are short and simple, usually only requiring some back and forth to deal with some puzzles, like say, finding a password or the right keys to a room to progress further. Depending on your taste, this can seem like a massive step backwards in design, and honestly makes these areas far less memorable, barring whatever kooky antic the place has in store. There were times I needed to use my brain to try and get some treasure, but those moments were rare. And admittedly, there are a few that required a bit more thought, like the Tower of Salt, aka the in-game metaphor for the people who didn't like that Yori wasn't in this game, where you did need to go around to different crystals just to make a path to the next area. Hell, I was actually stuck in one puzzle, and the main character got so frustrated that he ended up solving it for me. While not every joke in this game lands for me, that was pretty funny. Plus, some of the side quests do require a bit of extra planning. Ning, for example, has quests dealing with hunting rare creatures. At first, things seem simple as you just need to be at the right place with the right bait, but then things are made complex enough that I need a guide to figure out where to put the right set of bait in certain spots to corner the creatures. And if you're worried about the game lacking content, don't worry, you can get about over 40 hours, maybe even 50, and I didn't even get a chance to do the hardest dungeon in the game. The designs for the enemies, however, barring, uh, some of these, have a few less silly designs as if to offset the humor the game is trying to go for. And while everything about the gameplay, the presentation, the music, all of that stuff holds up pretty well, the story, well, screw it, I think it's better if we just dive into it right now. Our story starts with fan service, and this one opening scene meant to show an event in the future. Why do this? Likely to reassure that you are playing a Shadow Hearts game. Our main character this time is Johnny Gartland. You know, rather than be progressive with a female protagonist who is also Native American, we get a white boy. Okay. But he's also accompanied by a familiar face. Lenny! Sadly, Lenny isn't a party member. He's trying to run a detective agency, but it's clear the business is only supported thanks to his inheritance, as the job he gets aren't really all that great. At least until one of the villains gives him the task of hunting down... Vincent from Silent Hill 3? You know what? Give me the chance to stab this guy in the chest, and I'll take back any negatives I had about this game. He takes the job, believing this can help in his goal. But what is it exactly? Well, the reason he's a detective is to mostly find out his memories and is looking for any clues since he has amnesia, refusing to inherit his father's company until he solves the mystery. So at first you might be thinking this game will focus on finding clues of Johnny's past, maybe leading to some tragic or horrible truth that will force him to confront many different foes that may play an integral role in his past and... ...doesn't get touched on... ...for 32 hours... ...out of a 45 hour playthrough! So, rather than see him develop, he's mainly the guide for the player. The guy who freaks out over giant cats that know drunken kung fu and is also a boss of the mafia. I'm not making that, by the way. Along with so many other weird things. But the game also likes to remind us he is a teenager, and not just because of his intelligence either. Given some, uh, hormones. My name is Shania, and this is... I am Nathan. It is my honor. Uh, hi. Hmm? I just want to go on record that I did not edit that in. That is actually in the game. But after investigating a theater filled with thugs, he finds his man. Only to have him eaten and confronted with some weird creature. All seems lost until fan service. Yeah, I mean... Look, I'm not exactly wrong here. The game loves to show off Shania's ass and boobs quite a lot, even when she is in a demonic form. In fact, those forms actually seem sexier than usual. Truly, feminism marches on, and I forgot what I was saying. Uh, Shania Persender and Kagura, that's it. Well, okay, she's one of the few competent characters of the team. After saving Johnny's ass, she explains that she and her partner, Nathan, are on the hunt for creatures that spawned from the malice in the second game. Since all of it seems connected to the man he took the case from, he decides to join the duo. After being a ninja so weird and pathetic even Bang Shishigami from Blaze Blue would tilt his head at him, they eventually discover that Johnny is able to harness Malice into his knife. And after kicking the ass of the monster of the day, they try to hunt down Johnny's former client in the hope of gaining some answers, and to obviously stop the giant demons from coming into this world. As for the other cast that join the party over the course of the game, 
Okay, I'll be blunt. This band of characters feels like someone noticed the popularity of Joachim Valentine and proceeded to make everyone wacky and goofy as possible. As I mentioned before, you got Mao who does drunken martial arts. You got an old man as a ninja named Frank who does so many silly things he makes young Naruto look competent. A Native American who uses gun fu, which might be the most normal thing here, or second closest to normal. And then there's Yoakim's sister, Hilda, whose form changes based on calories. Usually either the gentle giant or the slim person who's going to beat the shit out of you with magic. You can guess which one I chose. Although there is actually another one who I feel is normal and has a legitimate reason to be in the story. And honestly is my favorite of the bunch. Ricardo, a mariachi who uses the power of song to strengthen his allies. And also take down his foes in freaking style. Unfortunately, there's a giant problem with them. The real meat of their stories are so disconnected with the main plot that you begin to wonder why the hell they are even here. Frank has to deal with his master, who is about as goofy as you expect, and we don't get any other story bits as to why he is hunting down Gilbert beyond the fact that he is evil. Hilda's story, well, you could easily skip it. She's only joining because she's bored, and her split personality doesn't make that huge of an impact on the story. Mao's main goal is to get famous in Hollywood or something, or whatever the hell this universe calls it, I honestly can't remember, and she eventually does so, becoming famous. And that's about it aside from her general knowledge about things and siphoning money from Al Capone. Nathan is supposed to protect Shania, but he hardly does anything else that tells us about his personality besides hunting. You do get a moment I failed to record that shows why he pursued power, which came from being scared of killing a bear on the attack when he was a kid. Another decent moment comes in explaining to Johnny why Shania is so dead set to kill one of the antagonists, and he does show concern for her violent tendencies, but that's sadly about it. Ricardo is the most fleshed out among the cast as he's pulled into the conflict when he hears the woman he loved was murdered by McManus and his mob, and then desires vengeance when it's revealed Edna has turned into a monster and he has no choice but to kill her. His side quests are also the only ones that feel legitimately serious, with a hint of tragedy to them, yet also some hope, especially when he briefly reunites with Edna Spear in the Dollhouse side quest. And it's at this point, I suddenly realize why I like Ricardo so much besides his musical talents. He was the only one among these characters to be given any damn story. Yeah, sure, Bridges his girlfriend, but at least it's something to keep me attached. It's especially easy to connect to him over Johnny or Shania when the game spends so little time on their story. Not to say there isn't some kind of development, though. With Johnny, well, it's basic. There's some development in the sense that he's becoming braver in the face of demons and learning to be smarter. But there's nothing engaging beyond that. Meanwhile, Shania is shown to be calm, intelligent, and even kind-hearted. Which is mainly just to help as a sharp contrast when she has vengeance on her brain for the main villains. But in the end, again, this is all pretty basic stuff. It's why I roll my eyes when people say Eve developed in the third birthday. Sure, she gets braver when facing down foes, but what else is there to her character? Sad part is, I think Lenny gets more development than his master, as he tries to help Johnny being a better detective by posing as a criminal who challenges Johnny with certain tasks and rewards him. At least the dude is trying to make the kid better, since the story doesn't seem to care. Covenant kind of had this problem as well, but at least those side quests were often memorable or told us something more about the characters. Except Lucia. You knew their goals knew what they wanted, and why they traveled with Yuri along with their connection to the antagonist. Hell, I throw Lucia under the bus every chance I get, but she actually does have a connection with one of the main villains in Covenant that was expanded in the director's cut. Almost everyone in this game, though, feels like a joke. Then there are main villains, Killer, Lady, and Gilbert, and they are about as interesting as their bland names. Much as I didn't care for Rasputin, his team was set up as a legitimate threat and could outsmart Yuri's gang, with Nikolai demonstrating his brains beat Yuri's brawn quite often, and we had entertaining minion fodder too. This gang of misfits is often on the run a lot, so seeing how strong they are is a rare sight, and they suffer the same damn problem as the other characters. Oh, the game will show us scenes of them, but it's almost always going to be the same damn thing like they always do, like Gilbert plying to try and take Lady for himself, Killer threatening the guy when it seems like he ain't useful anymore, a bored and blank stare from Lady that suddenly makes Reboot Dante a compelling character, you get the gist of it. So let's try and look what the main four can bring to the table. And how it's botched. Hand him over right now. And while you're at it, hand over your life. No, to both. 
By now, or maybe a few minutes ago, you're probably wondering why Lenny isn't even a playable character. Given his link to Malice through his former master unleashing it onto the world, and his need to protect Johnny since he is his current master, you would think he'd be more than just something Johnny could just summon with a phone call, right? Well, that's the thing, if he was in the party and had met Roger Bacon earlier, the twist likely would have come significantly sooner. Basically, Lenny was hiding how Johnny died in a car crash along with his sister. While he was away, Johnny's father and the other guy Johnny tried to find, you know, the guy who turned into Monster Chow, were trying to resurrect the kids through the use of the Emigre manuscript, while also dressing their kids up in these outfits. I want to point out that he chose to make them wear these. Anyway, Roger tried to stop them, but to his surprise, the two were actually succeeding. At least until the dad decided to get the bright idea to stop, but then again, he was likely stunned at seeing his daughter alive again. When Grace saw that Johnny wasn't reviving, she gave all of her will, the energy that opposes Malice, to him, leading her to die once again and a being called Lady to be born. Now faced with this knowledge, Johnny has to decide whether he can kill Lady or not for about a cutscene or two. Also, we never understand how he's able to control his awaker form. Despite the first time he did this, he nearly killed all his friends. Still, that may not be the only issue, as Shania reveals that Lady did kiss her after the first spite, storing Malice inside of her meaning Shania could potentially go crazy and kill people too. Really, all this does is show their strong friendship, with Johnny saying how he will protect her, how they will stop each other if either of them goes crazy, and helps her when she tries to obtain the sun fusion given the risk it poses. There's honestly not much for me to analyze, if anything. This is basic character stuff. Had the twist been revealed earlier, we might have gotten more out of the two. Let me put it this way, in Devil May Cry 3, we saw how Lady's anger towards her father drove her towards a darker path unwilling to see demons as anything but pure evil, shooting Dante any chance she got. Admittedly, he does some stuff that does warrant a bullet or two. She eventually needed to fight Dante to let her anger out and learn how to trust him, and he in turn started to learn what family was about, and how to care about the mess he was roped into rather than just focus on personal pleasure through fighting, and this was done in a rather short game. Then we have Shanae, who is vengeful at the slaughter of her people, and she stays vengeful, but that's about it. At worst, the vengeance makes her hasty and slip up, which really isn't all that compelling, honestly. We know Lady is way too strong for the group. Sure, maybe her getting angry at the party or something, but again, there's not really a whole lot of drama to keep this going. And that's about it. Her anger stopping only when Johnny is seemingly killed by Killer. Not to mention, it wasn't like it was her fault anyway. Seriously, someone should have just hurled Killer off the side of that bridge. Or well, they could have, oh, I don't know, checked on him restrained him, killed him, anything. Meanwhile, in the evil camp, Killer is a frustrating villain since the game often hints at how dangerous he is and doesn't really give us some good examples or show us how twisted his own psyche is beyond some threats and stabbing Johnny. Sure, some people wanted to get away from him, even the likes of Al Capone, but that just tells me instead of showing what kind of threat he really is. And I'm not counting the time the party lost either, they only lost because the demon decided to self-destruct like a freaking electrode. And then suddenly the game wanted me to build sympathy for him when he says to Lady that he was never really cared for in such a way. I.e. her reviving him with a kiss and everything. Gee, I wonder why, you fucking psychopath. I suppose one could say something like, Well, he was resurrected with malice, energy that is made of the hatred and evilness of humanity. Yet only when he got a taste of that did he finally gain a heart. Except Lady is the only one he cares about, and he's so single-minded in his goal that it reminds me of what happened to Edna, and she was basically a monster in that state. At least her story was more sympathetic due to her finally reuniting with the man she loves, yet having to ask him to kill her because she doesn't want to live on as a monster and make him suffer. Also, I just realized that even Edna, a side character, had more to her than the main antagonists. The only interesting bit is how Lady reacts when Killer ends up sacrificing himself for her. For once in the game, she starts to exhibit emotions, which is odd not only because of her acting without much care, but the fact that she technically only has malice inside of her. Death and destruction is all too common for anyone standing in her way. Just ask her dad. Yet in one scene, she is trying so desperately to defend and bring Killer back to life. It's actually an interesting turn that could have had more of an impact on the plot, like if she was maybe struggling with this power, or learning about the world and not knowing what is right and what is wrong. When she brings Edna back to life, that seemed like a perfect time to capitalize on this idea. But again, any kind of character stuff is saved right towards the end, especially when Gilbert is just trying to use her for evil because he's basically Tim Burton's penguin. At the end of the day, this game is not bad because we aren't following Yuri. This game is not bad because these characters are too silly. 
This game is not even bad for having uninteresting antagonists. It's okay to have villains that just want the world to burn. And yes, I will be correcting my review on Dragon Quest VIII regarding Rapthorn. But if you expect us to feel sympathy for these two characters, I need more to go on. And really, the story is bad because the writers decide not to actually expand these characters and just save the information right towards the end. Where at best, you maybe have like an hour or three to actually do anything with it. And even then, that's pretty much going to be consumed by all the gameplay. Not to mention, this is a freaking 30 to 50 hour RPG, which has no damn excuse beyond incompetence. Hell, even Mega Man X Command Mission made me care more about the characters, and that barely has a plot too. And honestly, the only reason I did this review was because it was requested. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed me saying basically nothing about this game for about 20 to 30 minutes. as a rehearsal. But overall, how do Shadow Hearts from the New World manage to hold up today? Well, I had some fun with the gameplay at least. That's really one of the only positives I can give this game. And the music. I can see why some fans hate this, but... I hardly can. I mean, Yuri's journey technically ended by the time Covenant was over, so I wasn't left bitter from this game not following up with his stuff. Making a new Shadow Hearts game focusing on new characters made sense in a way. Plus, the gameplay was enjoyable with a fantastic update of Covenant's combat mechanics that improve on everything and makes things feel a bit less broken, along with a soundtrack that always kept me in the mood to play. Unfortunately, I can't say the same thing for the story, not when it takes its sweet-ass time remembering, oh right, Johnny is the main character too, we should probably do something with him. I mean, what we got was okay at best, but it paled in comparison to what came before and hardly left me invested. And anyone else with less patience would likely drop it due to the focus on the other characters that aren't really going to amount to much beyond Shania. Comedy is not a thing that automatically kills a game. Devil May Cry and Shadow Hearts itself have made it work before, but if you don't add any substance, any reason for the player to stick around for the main characters and force them to wait over 30 freaking hours, then don't be surprised when your game ends up in the bargain bin. Or overpriced on eBay. Seriously, it isn't worth that much. If you don't care about story, fine. Then try this out. And then again, I'm wondering why you're even on this channel to begin with. But if you were hoping for even the smallest bit of feelings that the previous two games could give, sorry, you aren't missing a thing. Barring maybe some comedy, but even then, there are way better games for that too. And before you say titties, yes, there are way better games for that too. Well, that was a depressing point to end on. I freaking love the Shadow Hearts series. I love doing this channel just to get into these games, but now it's just... It's all over, unless, you know, they miraculously are able to pull out another Shadow Hearts game. You know, that isn't Pachinko, and no, I'm not covering Chaos Wars. Screw that noise. But hopefully I can just find a series that can replace it. Something I can show my love towards, but... I don't know which one, guys. I'm I'm having a really hard time figuring out what I should cover. I mean, what else could I possibly cover on this show that I really, really love? Or I want to get into more? It's it's a real mystery. What do you think, Raiho? Yeah, it's truly a stuffer, man. Even this detective can't figure it out. Anyway, I'm the smartest moron, and thank you for your time.